The girl painfully covered her eye, shouting loudly, get it off. The paramedics asked her what was in her eye. As the girl lowered her left hand, both of them couldn't help but frown. There was a fish hook hanging from her eyelid. Her father said he turned around for a minute, and his daughter just started screaming. Brett told the girl not to be afraid, and to lie down on that bench, nice and slow. When the girl took her left hand away again, they had to immobilize that lure or transported her. After careful observation, Mikami thought she could detach the hook from the lure there. Brett agreed to her idea. At this point, Brett softly reassured the girl, promising it wouldn't hurt at all, as long as she stayed very still. Then she held the girl's hand. Mikami swiftly and neatly cut the fishing line, and then gently helped her up. They still had one more thing to do, because both eyes moved together to keep the injured eye still. They needed to cover the uninjured eye as well. The girl now trusted Brett completely, and obediently closed her eye. Brett made a gauze pad, and then gently secured the hook. Mikami wrapped the gauze in layers. Then both of them helped the girl up to head to the hospital. These women were all about to give birth, yet they didn't go to the hospital, instead they came to a yoga session. One woman suddenly got herself stuck in a locust pose, paramedics arrived, and found there was no trauma to the belly, vitals seemed normal. The woman likely slipped a disc, as the paramedics were about to get her on her side. Another situation arose on the other side. I think I'm having contractions. Upon learning her due date was in three days, Bobby speculated it was a soft labor. He thought the contractions would subside once she relaxed and drank some water, but then suddenly, a third oh woman's God, water broke. The woman immediately took off her pants. Buck said, her contractions had just started, and the baby wouldn't come immediately. I know, this is my fourth kid, it's coming. Bobby soon realized the second woman's contractions were too rapid for safe transport. She had to give birth on the spot which he could handle. On the other side, a fourth woman went into labor as well. The instructor mentioned the influence of the full moon and regretted having the session. The second woman pushed and the baby girl was successfully delivered. Seeing Buck's flustered expression, the third woman reminded him she didn't need much assistance. Bobby discovered the fourth woman was experiencing cephalopelvic disproportion, meaning the baby's head was too large to fit through, and could only be delivered at a hospital. Just then reinforcements arrived. To prove that the sofa was a fire hazard, he threw a match onto the newly bought couch. The furniture factory owner, however, thought the firefighter was making trouble. But in the next second, the couch ignited instantly just like gasoline. The owner was stunned. The reason the couch was so flammable was due to issues with the materials, and some consumers had already suffered because of it. Just a few days ago, firefighters arrived at a scene where there was only a faint smoke at the window, but as soon as they reached the door, an an explosion suddenly occurred inside the house. A firefighter kicked the door open, only to find a raging fire inside. A woman was trapped. If the firefighters hadn't arrived in time, the consequences would have been very bad. According to the woman's account, a couple of embers from her candle had accidentally landed on the couch. When she got up to fetch the extinguisher, the couch caught fire as it soaked in gasoline, and she couldn't understand why. Herman also found it very strange. They flipped the sofa over and saw that it was indeed filled with polyurethane, which was basically gasoline in solid form. And he also discovered that the manufacturer was a well-known local furniture factory? An elderly woman living alone called 911, saying there was a man outside her house staring at her. She had a panic attack. Police and paramedics arrived. Athena began searching around the premises. Just then, Hen noticed something. Chimney's reflection can just be seen in the glass of the doorframe, and the muddy marks in the room indicated that the man was inside the house at that time. When the woman called the 911, the man was likely right behind her, but he didn't harm her. The cop didn't pursue the matter further, however, for safety's sake, the woman called her daughter to accompany her tonight. But just as the daughter got home, she received a call from the 911 operator. The daughter thought the operator was just checking up, so she was quite surprised. Her mother also remarked that's so sweet, but the next news made the daughter anxious. The man who appeared at the, her mother's house earlier was likely her ex-husband, and the man had a history of violence. The reason he didn't harm her mother was likely to obtain her address. At that moment, the daughter went to the window and indeed saw her ex-husband standing there. The man quickly charged inside, holding a knife, kicked open the bedroom door, only to find the elderly woman alone. But in the next second, we're fine. I was ready for him this time. Thanks to you. Good. The man was holding his head and pacing around the room, shouting get it off me, as if something had crawled into his head. The neighbor said he had been like this for 20 minutes. The paramedic asked him what was in his head, but he just cried and said it's in here. Brett asked if he has any history of drug abuse or psychiatric issues. The neighbor said he is a pretty chill guy. Seeing this Mikami stepped forward to check the situation. Others also tried to help, but the man wouldn't stop, continuing to crash around the room, shouting it's moving everywhere. Okay, grab me the amio. You think he's going into cardiac arrest? It's not for him. It seemed Mikami figured out the cause. She secretly moved to the man's side, and then injected Amio into his ear. After that, the man's movements slowly calmed down. Oh, no. <laughs> Brett had him lie on his side on the floor. At this moment, they finally saw what was inside. Oh, you wanna do this part? Not a chance. Brett carefully inserted tweezers into his ear. A live bug was gently pulled out, but it accidentally fell to the ground, and then...
A man was unconscious and trapped on a roof, his body entangled in a cable. Firefighters rushed to the scene. Discovering that his breathing was constricted, Kelly ordered the team to cut the cable and then to check the other side, but found a second victim hanging over the ledge of the building. Hey, hey, hold it! Kelly quickly inquired about the estimated arrival time of the ladder truck, learning that it would take three more minutes. Meanwhile, the man had a weak pulse. On the brink of life and death, Kelly decided to take a risk. He instructed the team to find a fixed point and decided to rappel down for the rescue, telling the paramedic to be ready to cut the cable. Sarah, are you sure about this? Just don't let go of the rope. He slowly descended along the wall, then tightly secured the man, while notifying the team to cut the cable. As the cable was cut, the rooftop team slid forward rapidly. Crews could barely hold the rope with the weight of two men on it, and it seemed they were about to fall off the building. At the last moment, Brett made a desperate leap and grabbed the rope, stopping the slide once again. At that moment, the truck finally arrived. Ladder was raised, both Kelly and the man were rescued. To have a cool Halloween, the man bought a guillotine prop, but his wife thought it was dangerous. To ease his wife's concerns, the man gave a live demonstration. Unexpected the blade came loose as it fell and struck his neck. Fortunately, it didn't cut the artery. The firefighter told him to stay calm and not move because there was another laceration on the other side which looked close to the carotid. They needed to rescue him quickly. They tried to lift the blade above to relieve the pressure on his neck, but the blade was stuck tight. The lieutenant quickly asked her men to start cutting and to stand by with the rabbit tool. As the firefighter began cutting, the man shouted loudly, don't wreck it. It's from a tale of two cities the musical. The firefighters carefully controlled their actions, sawing only the wooden boards on both sides. Then bracing the rabbit tool inside, finally they lifted the stuck blade. Upon examination, they found the man's cervical spine was okay. The worst part was over. The paramedics quickly bandaged him and then sent him to the hospital for a checkup. At this moment, his wife said, Artie, I'm getting rid of that stupid thing today. Are you? This 12-year-old boy was on a ventilator, but a prolonged power outage in the city meant the breathing machine's power was running out. The mother quickly dialed 911. Do you have any backup batteries? Just then the power on the breathing machine ran out completely. The mother could only plead for urgent assistance while manually helping her son to breathe. Meanwhile, the dispatcher spotted solar panels on a rooftop. She immediately made a call to confirm and then explained the situation to the owner. However, the boy's house was on the other side, so they needed to figure out how to get the power across. The neighbors sprang into action. She found a bunch of wires, connected it to the electrical box, and then went outside, calling out to other neighbors. They linked the wires one by one across streets and alleys, over high walls, across rooftops and over treetops hi i'm your neighbor can i come in the neighbor connected the wire to the breathing machine but found they were a bit short they didn't have any more wires they used christmas lights to bridge the gap as the colorful lights lit up the boy's breathing machine restarted the mother slowly stepped outside and saw many happy faces could there be anything more tragic than this the girl was supposed to be in the happiest moment of her life but she faced one misfortune after another even her parents were involved in an accident and she herself was buried under the rubble just a moment ago a newlywed couple made their vows in front of family and friends next according to indian customs it was time for singing and dancing <laughs> Suddenly, firefighters arrived. 16 guests lost their lives on the spot. As the rescue continued, the injured were gradually carried out. Meanwhile, the groom frantically searched for the bride. But when the firefighter asked him what the bride looked like, the man said he didn't remember. It was an Indian custom that before marriage no one knows what the other looks like. Everyone hurried to search. Soon, the captain found a woman under the rubble, dressed in red, who must have been the bride. The two of them worked together to rescue her. Fortunately, the bride was unharmed. Just then the captain noticed that this hotel was originally supposed to have only two floors. The third floor where the incident occurred was illegally added on. It wasn't built with reinforced concrete, but with inferior materials. He angrily attacked the owner until another teammate pulled him away. 